God is in complete control. But are prophecies actually being fulfilled in our lifetime? In this message, Pastor Skip takes a close look at events like the Abraham Accords. This is Calvary Church with Skip Isaac. We're so glad you've joined us today. Whether or not you follow the news, there's no question we're accelerating towards the end times. There's also no question that God is in complete control. But are prophecies actually being fulfilled in our lifetime? In this message, Pastor Skip takes a close look at events like the Abraham Accords, COVID-19, and the Russia-Ukraine conflict through the lens of biblical prophecy. Here's Pastor Skip. Uh, turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Luke, Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. So, Sherlock Holmes went camping with his faithful associate, Dr. Watson. They fell asleep. Hours later, Sherlock Holmes woke up and nudged his friend, Watson, and said, Watson, look up and tell me what you see. Watson opened his eyes and said, I see a fantastic panorama of countless stars. Sherlock Holmes says, and what does that tell you? Watson said, astronomically, that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. Horologically, I can deduce that the time is a quarter past three. Theologically, that God is all-powerful and that we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, I suspect that we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. And then Watson says, why, Sherlock, what does it tell you? And he said, that someone has stolen our tent. Obvious, right? That's, that's the obvious observation. I feel that lots of people do what Watson did when it comes to end times prophecy. They get so elaborate that they miss the immediate. And the immediate is simply this. Be ready. We should be ready. Watch, therefore, Jesus said, and he told us to be ready. I have uh, read uh, about a week or so ago a new research study by Pew Research that said something that got my attention. Uh, it, um, it put out th these statistics, four in 10 Americans believe we are living in the end times. Four in 10 Americans believe we are living in the end times. Uh, it stated, 55%, over half of all Americans say we're in the last days and Jesus is coming back to the earth one day. That's a significantly high rate of people, group of people. Though most will say they don't know what the timing will be, some believe that he will return in their lifetime. Here's what's amazing about that research poll. That's not just a poll of evangelical Christians. That's a poll of Americans of all races and religions and political viewpoints. Which begs the question, why? Why are so many people now, more than ever before, saying, I think we might be living in the last days? Well, look back on 2022. It's been a turbulent year. It's been a turbulent few years. Back in March, Russia invaded Ukraine. 200,000 soldiers have been killed, about 400,000 civilians. So when you have a half a million plus people dying in a war or rumors of war, that gets people's attention. Also, this is now the third year of the pandemic, and the number of COVID deaths have topped 6.6 .6 million. Add to that inflation, not just in our country, inflation around the world has touched virtually every country. And it is especially hitting low and middle class income people. So the name of this message today, this prophecy update, 
is what will the future hold? What will the future hold? And this message is sort of a, an introduction to something that we'll be looking at in a few weeks after we're done with Colossians when we look at a series on eschatology or the end times. Now, the Bible does predict the future. The Bible clearly predicts the future. But I find there are two extremes with people reading the Bible that predicts the future. One extreme is overstatement. The other extreme is understatement. Some overstate it. Some are fanatics about Bible prophecy. It's all they talk about. They build their entire ministry on it. Everything is sensationalized. They see everything as a sign from God, uh, from a Jewish festival to a blood moon to the logo of Starbucks. Everything is a sign from God. But the other extreme is understatement, and perhaps understatement is a reaction to, number one, the overstatement. Because so many people overstate it, hey, let's just not talk about it. Let's just not deal with it. It seems for some, there is a refusal to deal with the idea of the end times or of prophecy. Um, partly it's because of, number one, an overreaction to prophecy. But, but for some who don't talk about it at all, it's partly because they have a theological construct. There's a history of their uh, interpretation that sort of forbids them from doing that. We will go into more depth uh, in our series. Uh, but what's interesting about this particular group that makes the, the understatement of Bible prophecy is that so often this very group is the group that is known for digging deep and championing the great doctrines of the Bible. They're really good at, at uncovering every stone when it comes to the doctrine of grace, salvation, sanctification, the church, soteriology. But when it comes to prophecy, it's like they're an abysmal failure. They don't talk about it. They don't see it. Uh, it's like God is, is unfolding signs right before their eyes, but their head is in the theological sand. We want to... We want to approach this in a balanced way. So today, what I'm going to do, and I'm just going to scratch the surface of this chapter. It's just really a deep uh, section of Scripture. But um, I, am, I am going to predict the future today. I'm going to predict the future through the lens of Luke chapter 21. And I'm going to tell you things that will happen. I'm going to give you four certainties about the future. Here's the first. There will be an end. There will be an end. I know I'm starting very general here, right? There will one day be an end, an end of the world. Uh, let's uh, pick it up in verse 7. So they, they being the disciples, asked him, Jesus, saying, Teacher, when will these things be? And what sign will there be that these things are about to take place? And he said to them, Take heed that you do not be deceived, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time has drawn near. Therefore, do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified, because we've always had wars. We've always had commotions. Do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but the end is or will not come immediately. That's not to say the end will not come, but the end will not come immediately. It will come, definitely, but in God's perfect time. So go down to verse 32. Verse 32, Jesus is talking. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away. Notice that. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. One day the world will end. We know that from a biblical perspective. We know that one day the world will come to an end, Jesus said in Matthew 24. Okay, let, let me pause just for a moment because you're going to hear me refer to this, and this is sort of nuts and bolts. Matthew chapter 24, Luke chapter 21, Mark chapter 13 
are all essentially about the same sermon that Jesus gave called the Olivet Discourse. It's a little more detailed in Matthew 24, less so in Luke 21, less so in Mark 13, for a host of reasons I'm not going to uncover today. But it's from different vantage points, but same basic territory. So in Matthew 24, the parallel text to this, Jesus said, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. There's Jesus saying, the end's going to come one day. Paul, the apostle, knew that to be the truth. When he gave us that great chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, about the resurrection of the dead at the coming of Christ, he said, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God, the Father, and he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. So Jesus said the end is coming. Paul said the end is coming. Peter not only said the end is coming, but he describes the end of the world. 2 Peter chapter 3, he says, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? The word dissolve in that verse means to unloose or to set free what is bound. The idea is that the elements will be broken up into their component parts, like a building being torn down. The physical structure of the universe will disintegrate. If I could put it like this, the creation will be uncreated. It will be dissolved. Now, we know that from the Bible, but we also know that from the scientific community that regularly reminds us that we live in a limited universe. Uh, We didn't always believe this. Science didn't always teach this. But uh, we have come to the understanding that uh, um, the universe is expanding. We have observed radiation echo, which adds credence to that idea. But did you know up until the 1950s and really the 1960s, the scientific community said that the universe is just eternal. It's just going to go on and on and on. It was called the steady state theory the steady state theory. That was the prevailing cosmology of the day. Today, we know better. We know different. We've added to our knowledge base. And so there's different theories as to how the universe is going to end, but one thing everybody agrees on, it's going to end. It's going to end. The universe is running down. There are certain scientific realities that are undeniable, and unbreakable laws, scientific laws. One of them is the now famous second law of thermodynamics, which basically says everything in the material universe is experiencing energy loss or heat death. It's like a clock that has been wound up that is running down. So this is easily observable. Cars, over time, don't get shinier or more efficient, right? They rust and they break down. Human beings over time don't grow stronger as they get really old. They grow weaker. We don't become uh, less wrinklier uh, over time. The second law of thermodynamics, I checked this morning in the mirror, is at work. (laughs) There will be an end. There will be an end. That's one prediction. Second, 
Jesus will be back. Jesus will be back. In chapter 21, our chapter, verse 27, one sentence. Then, after all these things he talks about, then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. The Son of Man is a messianic term, it is, and all the Jews knew that. He was speaking about a reference of Daniel chapter 7, a vision of the Son of Man who, who is given a kingdom. They will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 24, remember I said that there's three chapters that deal with this all of a discourse. Matthew 24, the disciples are walking with Jesus up the Mount of Olives, and they ask him a question. They said, um, not only when will these things be, but what is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And chapter 24 and Luke 21 is the answer to that question. What will be the sign of your coming? Now, isn't that an odd question to ask somebody who's standing there with him? He's already there. And he says, so, when are you coming? You know, you might think Jesus is going to say, did you notice I'm with you guys? <laughs> now, when they asked that question, they did not think of his second coming. You might automatically go, oh, they're, he's, they're mentioning. They didn't know about a second coming. They didn't believe in a second coming. They thought the Messiah is coming. Okay, he has come. He's here. When they said the sign of your coming, they believe he's going to stay there, but there's going to be some punctuating event. That was their eschatology. That was their belief that the Messiah is going to now rule over the enemies of Israel and set up his kingdom. That's what they meant by coming. Some punctuating event, not a return. However, that's what they thought. In a couple days from that question, he takes him up to an upper room where they have the Passover, the Last Supper. And Jesus unloads the truth on them that he is going to die, that he's going to be crucified and then rise again. Now, when they heard that, I am convinced it was like this. Does not compute. <laughs> they did, did not get it at all. But in that conversation, Jesus said to his disciples, because he could tell that they were really bothered by this. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions or rooms or dwellings, literally. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He says two things, I'm going and I'm coming again. I'm going and I'm coming again. Ever since Jesus spoke that promise, that has been the blessed hope of the church for the last 2,000 years. That's why Paul in Titus 2 called it that, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is why so many of the hymns of the historic Christian church have been about the coming of Christ, the second coming. We sing them at Christmas because we think they're Christmas songs, but they're not. They're second coming songs. One is the Isaac Watts anthem, Joy to the World, the Lord is Come, Let Earth Receive Her King. It's about the second coming. Or the Charles Wesley hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. It's about the second coming. Julia Ward Howe wrote Battle Hymn of the Republic after the Civil War. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. It's about the second coming. And it's because 
this is one of the dominant themes of Scripture. Did you know that? The second coming of Jesus Christ dominates the Bible. Next to the subject of faith, the coming of Christ in the future is the most discussed topic in the book. You know how many times? 1,845 times. 1,845 times that second coming is alluded to or predicted. That's one out of every 25 verses in the New Testament that mention it. So out of 260 chapters that comprise Matthew to Revelation, there are in the New Testament 318 times second coming is spoken of. For every one mention of the first coming of Jesus, the second coming is mentioned eight times. So the first coming is pretty important, right? Pretty important. Jesus coming to earth, dying on a cross. We celebrate the first coming every Christmas. Pretty important. Eight times more the second coming. For every one time the subject of atonement appears, the second coming is mentioned twice. So it's, it's, it's pretty important. So uh, we know two things that we can predict. There will be an end of the world. Jesus will be back. I'll give you a third. Third, there will be signs. There will be signs. You notice the question in verse 7. They asked him, teacher, but when will these things be? And what sign will there be that these things are about to take place? Verse 11. And there will be great earthquakes in various places, famines, pestilences, and there will be frightful signs and great sights and great signs from heaven. Go down to verse 25. And there will be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, and on earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Go down to verse 31. So you also, so you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Signs, signs, signals. The Greek word semion, which means markers or indicators or signals. God is a God of signs. He gives indicators when he is about to do something. You know why he does that? Because he wants people to be aware that he's doing something. Hence the sign. Just like you have a road sign. It tells you what is coming ahead. In Amos chapter 3, verse 7, he writes, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. So when God is going to do something, he warns his people. He sends a sign so his people will know that he's going to do something. You remember when the religious leaders came to Jesus and they said, we want a sign from heaven. And Jesus responded to them in his loving tone, hypocrites, and I, I, I don't say that tongue-in-cheek, he was always love incarnate. And even when he unloaded on his enemies, he still spoke that harsh word in love. He said, hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Now, what was he talking about there? His first coming. His first coming, the Messiah, the Messiah came to Israel. They should have seen the signs. Did you know there were signs of his first coming? You know how many signs there were? About 300. About 330 signs. Now, if you're driving down the road and you see 330 signs, you better not be surprised when you end up wherever it says you're going to be ending up at. 300 to 330 signs like... And here's his personal profile in the Old Testament. Messiah will be, be from the tribe of Judah. He'll be born in Bethlehem. He'll be from the lineage of King David. He'll arrive before the temple is destroyed and others. 
Now, I know that, and we'll talk about this a little more in our series, I know that the last days technically started 2,000 years ago. If you look at all of world history, the last days is from the time of Christ's first coming to the time of his second coming. But I think there is some indication that we could be in like the last days of the last days, the final days of that time period. There are signs the prophets gave. There are signs that Paul gave. There are signs that Jesus gave in Luke 21, Matthew 24, Mark 13, as well as other places. Now, something else. Now, this is sort of nuts and bolts a little bit here. The signs that are mentioned in those three New Testament chapters, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, the signs that Jesus gives are signs that will take place primarily in a future time period called in the Old Testament the 70th week of Daniel. you got to know Daniel 9 to understand that phrase. The 70th week of Daniel, a seven-year future time period the New Testament refers to as the tribulation period. And more specifically, it'll be the last three and a half years of that seven-year period known as the great tribulation period. So those are the signs that he speaks of. We are not in that time period right now. We are not in that future eschatological time of the tribulation, but it sure seems like we're getting right up to the edge of it. Now, something else that will be helpful. In the Matthew 24 rendition of the Olivet Discourse, when Jesus gives the signs, there's going to be this and this and that and watch for this and that, he says this. In, I think, Matthew 24, verse 7 or verse 8. The, verse 8. These are the beginning of sorrows. Literally, birth pains or birth pangs. These are the beginning of birth pains. Now, we know something about birth pains. Women especially know. I mean, I'm just, I have, I have observed them. Uh, but birth pains happen not at the beginning of pregnancy, not in the middle, but they happen right before a... Uh, Birth, hence the term birth pains. So there are contractions that occur, but you know that they're uh, important enough to go to, to the doctor or the hospital or the birthing clinic uh, or the midwife when the birth pains are more frequent and more intense. You can time them, they're regular, and they intensify. So Jesus gave signs, but he said they're like the birth pains of a woman in labor. You know the baby's going to be born because they're more frequent and more intense. So there's a tension, a pain, and then a, relax, uh, a relaxation, a reprieve. And so uh, we, we all have some cataclysm on the earth and then a reprieve. But the closer we get to the very end, the closer we get to that period, the closer and more intense those contractions are going to occur. So look at verse 28. Now when these things, all the things he's been talking about, when these things begin to happen, begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. So let's consider some things that are beginning to happen. What can we look at in our modern world that would be an indication that these things are beginning to happen? Well, let me give you sort of the most obvious one. We'll start at the broadest one, and that is this. Israel is back in their land. That happened May 14th of 1948. That is significant. Prophetically speaking, this I would consider a mega sign Israel is back in the land. Now, why is that important to us? Here's why. The context of these chapters, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, the context of these chapters is Jewish. It's not Baptist. It's not Presbyterian. It's not Calvary Chapel. It's not American. It's Jewish. Jesus talks about Judea. That's a geographic area in Israel. He talks about Jerusalem. That's a city there. 
He says, inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he speaks of the Sabbath day. Pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath. So the context is very, very Jewish. Because of that fact, it necessitates that Israel has to be in their land. So the events he speaks about made sense if they happened then, when he spoke them 2,000 years ago, before 70 AD. They didn't, by the way. They're cataclysmic. Or they have to happen after May 14, 1948, when Israel is in the land and you have inhabitants of Jerusalem who are worried about the Sabbath day. So the Jews being in their homeland is the first prerequisite. This is why biblical scholars, May 14, 1948, make such a big deal out of that event. So that's number one, Israel is in their land. Here's, a, here's something else that I think we're seeing. There is a coalition of nations that is forming right now that has prophetic implications. I'm speaking about three nations in particular, Russia, Iran, and Turkey. Russia, Iran, and Turkey. So let me just sort of bring you up to speed. You probably already know this if you have looked at the news to any degree. Uh, in recent years, Vladimir Putin has made no bones about the fact that he wants the reunification of uh, the Soviet Union, the Soviet bloc. He sort of snuck back into Georgia, the Republic of Georgia, not the state of Georgia. Uh, in 2008, he annexed Crimea in 2015, and in March of 2022, he invaded the Ukraine, all according to his grand plan. But did you know he also has an interest in the Middle East. Uh, you may not know that uh, Russia has established a permanent naval base in Syria. The northern part of the port city of Tartus is a Russian naval base, a quite substantive Russian naval base. The Russians helped Iran build their second, second nuclear facility and today, at present, there are 1,000 or so Russian nuclear scientists working in Iran. So they have this interesting relationship, which has we've never seen it historically. Um, also, the Mossad chief this week, David Barnea, said that Iran has delivered weapons to Russia the past few months and plans to deliver more weapons to Russia in the future. So Russia and Iran are just interesting to watch. But there's a third player I mentioned, and that is Turkey. Turkey is overseen by its president, Erdogan, who was at one time a moderate Muslim. Today, uh, he has been moving quite to the extreme end of being uh, Islamic. In 2017, Turkey signed with Russia a $2.5 billion deal for a state-of-the-art anti-ballistic defense system. So you just have this interesting configuration of Russia and Iran and Turkey. Why is that important? Well, the Bible predicts that in the end of days, there will be a battle fought against Israel by a group of nations who form a coalition. Ezekiel 38 and 39 describe those nations, name those nations. One group is Magog, Rosh, and Meshach. Any historian will tell you that's Russia. They make a coalition with ancient Persia, which is modern-day Iran. And they also make a coalition with the nation of Gomer, which is modern-day Turkey. Russia, Iran, Turkey. It says in the text, they'll form a coalition and they will come against Israel in the last days. So, that presupposes certain conditions. Number one, it presupposes that there will be an, a nation of Israel. May 14th, 1948. Pretty recent. So, the precondition is that Israel has to be present in the land. Not just present in the land, prosperous in the land. Ezekiel 36, God says, I will multiply you. I will do better for you than at your beginnings. So the whole chapter talks about Israeli prosperity. And if you know anything about the GDP of Israel today, it's one of the strongest nations going. 
Not just present, not just prosperous, but also peaceful. Have you looked at the Middle East in the last hundred years? It's not a peaceful place. It's a rough neighborhood. You've got 411 billion, uh, or 411 million, excuse me, uh, uh, neighbors who want nothing more than the total elimination of the state of Israel, and yet they exist. So Ezekiel 38 describes Israel right before this battle as a peaceful people dwelling securely, dwelling in safety. Which leads me to a third observation of what's going on. Israel is becoming more peaceful. I should really restate that. The region is becoming more peaceful. And that goes against historic norms. Back in uh, 2020, September 15th to be exact of 2020, I was there when it happened. I was on the south lawn of the White House when the Abraham Accords were signed. I know, the media just sort of whitewashed that and, and overlooked it. It is one of the most significant historic things ever to have happened, that Israel and Arab nations make peace. I mean, that's like Anwar Sadat, and that's what happened with Jordan years ago. But that day, foreign ministers of the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain signed a peace accord with Israel. Since then... Two more Arab countries have followed, Morocco, Sudan. Also since then, Kosovo, though not Arab, but certainly Muslim, has signed on to the Abraham Accords. And most recently, what happened just a few days ago, uh, the prime minister was sworn in, Bibi Netanyahu, is now his sixth term as prime minister of the nation of Israel, has stated that he intends to make peace with Saudi Arabia. Now think of this. Just think of what happened uh, in September 11th, 2001. And the whole world was looking at Saudi Arabia because that's where the terrorists came from. And certainly they're not making peace with the world. And most definitely they're not making peace with Israel. A diplomat from Israel said just the other day, their intention is to expand the Abraham Accords with Saudi Arabia this coming year. Now, why is that even important? Well, first of all, it's what you've been praying for, haven't you? Um, uh, uh, Psalm 122, for the last couple thousand years, Christians have been praying, as it says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Uh, Christians for hundreds of years have been praying that God would bring peace. He is answering their prayer. But second... It's prophetic because, again, a precondition for this war in the last days of Gog and Magog against Israel is regional stability. Now, we know that uh, a leader, a dictator, will come on the scene eventually in this period. We call him the Antichrist, though he's got about 50 different titles. We've just sort of landed on that one. The Antichrist will make a, an agreement, a peace deal with Israel, a seven-year peace agreement. He'll break it in the middle of that seven-year period. He promises to protect them, but then he'll break it. So we can just look at the chessboard. The pieces are all lining up in interesting fashion. And there, there's a fourth thing that I want to look to, a fourth trend, and that is this. The world is being conditioned to government control. The world is being conditioned for government control. Look at verse 11. He gives a, a list of signs. There will be great earthquakes in various places. There always has been earthquakes, um, especially if you live in the West Coast. Uh, famines, pestilences. Ooh, look at that word, pestilences. Um, what was COVID? Would that, would that qualify as a pestilence? If you were to look up in Webster's Dictionary the definition of pestilence, it says, quote, a contagion or infectious epidemic that is virulent and devastating. Now, primarily, again, I want to be responsible here. These are signs that deal specifically with the tribulation period. But COVID sure seemed to be in biblical proportion. It just felt apocalyptic. 
Uh, it was worldwide. It affected nearly everyone. Uh, and it provided universal government overreach in most every nation where some groups were called essential, some groups, including churches, were called non-essential. The government could now say that. You had to comply with that. And then as we're getting back to our normal routine, you've got to prove that you've been vaccinated or you will not be able to buy or sell. You will not be able to go into that restaurant and eat. You won't be able to do that. I want to share a quote from a, uh, an Israeli historian. He teaches at Hebrew University uh, currently. His name is Yuval Harari. He said, and I quote, COVID is what convinced people to accept and to legitimize total biometric surveillance. What a statement. Total biometric surveillance. He goes on, people could look back in a hundred years and identify the coronavirus epidemic as the moment when a new regime of surveillance took over, especially surveillance under the skin, which I think is maybe the most important development of the 21st century, is the ability to hack human beings, end quote. You know, for the last couple of thousand years, it just didn't seem possible that the whole world would one day be forced to take a mark. But today, it makes a lot more sense. I know, this doesn't perfectly qualify as a prophetic sign, but it is a precursor to it. I, I certainly now have a better understanding of how the events of the tribulation are going to be able to happen. Because you can motivate entire population bases with one emotion. It's called fear. Get them scared and you can get them to do anything. You can move them in any direction. The world is being conditioned to government control. So there will be an end. Jesus will be back and there will be signs. But I want to end with this. Number four, we will be saved. We will be saved. Doesn't mean that times are not going to get tough. Does not mean that we're not going to experience tribulation in the world. We will. Jesus promised we will. But the great tribulation is completely different. We will be saved. We already are saved. Um, I understand that. But I'm talking about saved from something specific. And in verse 28 again, let's close with this. When these things begin to happen, here's what you're to do. Look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Go down to verse 36. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. These things are coming, but pray that you can escape these things that are coming. Now, we live in the church age. This is the age of grace. Currently, God is doing a, a work around the world in getting his church together um, but the church age is going to come to an end. It's going to come to an end suddenly. Suddenly. Jesus said, or uh, the Bible says, it's coming like a thief in the night. Uh, thieves don't text you what time they're arriving. <laughs> right? Uh, they show up suddenly and unexpectedly. So we're living in the church age. The church age will abruptly come to an end. We call it the rapture of the church for a very good reason, by the way. And by the way, we'll deal with the fact that it is a long-standing belief, not a recent belief. Um, but then after that will be a period of Daniel's 70th week, the tribulation period, seven-year period. If you want to know what that's going to be like, you can read Revelation chapters 4 through 19 in great detail. Uh, the events are given of the tribulation period. After that, Jesus will return from heaven with his church. He will quell a rebellion that takes place in the Middle East. He'll establish his kingdom. And there are signs for when that's going to happen. Signs that Jesus speaks about. Signs that Paul reiterates. The signs that we're dealing with are signs of that future period, whereas the rapture is a signless event. 
signless event. In other words, it can happen at any time. But future events often cast their shadows before them. Future events often cast their shadows before them. That is, they appear in incipient form, in nascent form, before they, long before they appear in mega form. Here's an example I want to close with. I close with this. We'll put it up on the screen. It's from John Walvoord. He taught here many years ago. He's now in heaven. He said, there's all kinds of signs for Christmas. There are lights everywhere, decorations, Christmas trees, music, even Santa in the mall. But Thanksgiving can sneak up on you. There are no signs for Thanksgiving. The second coming of Christ is like Christmas. It will be preceded by many specific signs that the Scripture outlines. The rapture, however, is like Thanksgiving. There are no specific signs for its coming. It's fall, and you begin to see the signs of Christmas everywhere, and so you realize Thanksgiving is somewhere around the corner, too. We are starting to see the shadows fall that predict the second coming of Christ. And because of that, we know the rapture is closer than some of us expected. It's right around the corner. It can't be too far away. So all of this to say we should not only be ready, we should be excited. I know that these are fearful things, and if you really want to get scared, um, you can read the book of Revelation. Uh, it will tell you the catastrophic events. Jesus said the worst time in human history will play out on the stage during that last three and a half year time period. But the Bible also says this, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and of a sound mind. So I know Jesus said men's hearts will be failing them from fear and the expectation of what is coming on the earth. But for us, lift up your heads. Your redemption draws near, he said. Pray that you can escape all these things. And so I am looking up and I do pray and believe that I will escape all these things. We live in some very exciting times. And we ought to be equipped and knowledgeable about those times, hence the series that we're going to embark on after we finish this great book of Colossians, which we will in the next few weeks. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, the hope that we have. It's a very different emotion than the fear that the world has. You have not called us to live as fearful people, but as confident, faith-filled Sons and daughters of the living God and the King of kings and Lord of lords, you have not given us a spirit of fear, but power. And I pray, Lord, that we would walk in that and, and exercise in that uh, uh, our love for the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church with Skip Isaac. We would love to know how this message impacted you. Share your story with us. Email my story at calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church slash give. I used to be pretty clueless about shopping. Like when I heard I could save by getting cash back with Rakuten, I was like, as if. Then I was like, why didn't I do this sooner? You can get cash back on all the fashion at your fave beauty stores. <laughs> and on pretty much whatever. Who put that there? In conclusion, you'd have to be butt crazy to shop with that Rakuten. <laughs> whatever. Aren't you a little old for high school? <laughs> what? down on the valley of Armageddon from about a hundred feet above it and as we look down on this valley you look over your Bible from 30,000 feet as we continue the book of Revelation.
we are studying the book of Revelation. We're finishing it up tonight. A couple of little things. I have taught through this book on a Sunday morning covering 43 weeks of it. So we have it on archive if you want the CDs or tapes, if anybody uses tapes or MP3s. We have all that available. It's called History's Last Chapter. And I also put out a book that are outline studies of the whole book of Revelation. If you want further study, that's also available. Tonight we're going to cover the second half of the last book of the Bible, and we'll be done with the Bible from 30,000 feet. Revelation chapter 12 through chapter 22. Now before we dig right in, uh, we have a visitor tonight. You know, a lot of you know that we have different groups around the country and around the world that watch or listen to the Bible from 30,000 feet in churches or in home groups. And uh, we have uh, some visitors tonight from Oregon. They get the CDs and their printed material, and they get a group, and they meet within their home. And uh, Dave and his wife, I hear, are here with us tonight. Where are you guys? Stand up if you're here. I heard you were going to be here. Right there, right there toward the back. God bless you guys. We're glad you're with us tonight. And if you thought Chicago was the Windy City, this is the Windy City. Welcome to Albuquerque. Let's pray tonight. Father, we thank you that the wind of your Spirit is blowing in our midst, that the Holy Spirit is working and moving and teaching and taking us from glory to glory. We thank you that we're redeemed. We thank you, Father, that when we gather, there is authentic, real joy that happens. We celebrate because of what you've done and what you're doing. And sometimes, though you might not be doing it in our lives, we hear what you're doing in other people's lives, and we equally rejoice. And we're so thankful for our guests tonight, those who are joining us via radio tonight, via the Internet, and who will be later on uh, being a part of these studies. Bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, chapter 1, verse 19, is the outline to the book of Revelation. We covered that last week, but we need to cover it again this week simply because we're following the outline John gave us. John was told to write the things which he had seen. That's the vision of Christ in chapter 1, and he writes that down. The things which are, and that's chapters 2 and 3, the things of the church, the seven local churches in Asia Minor, the church age, and the things which will take place after these things. And that's the same language we get in chapter 4, verse 1. After these things, or after this, in Greek, metatauta, he was caught up into heaven in the spirit, and he saw things from a heavenly perspective. That's the outline of the book of Revelation. Now, one thing I did not tell you last week that I want to tell you tonight is not everybody shares the same view of the book of Revelation. There are at least four different eschatological viewpoints or ways to interpret the book of Revelation. And I want to briefly tell you what they are. There is number one, the preterist view. The preterist view is from a Latin word, preter, which means past. And this view sees the book of Revelation as already completely fulfilled in about the first three centuries of the Roman Empire. It's done with. It's over with. Now that viewpoint ignores the book's claim a couple of times that it is prophecy. Prophecy. It is for things yet future. Also, there are certain things that, if you take that viewpoint, don't fit. Like the second coming of Jesus Christ in chapter 19 and him setting up his kingdom. That didn't happen in the first few centuries of the Roman Empire. So you have a real problem holding the preterist view as I see it. Second viewpoint is the historical view. The historical view sees the book of Revelation as a panorama of church history from apostolic times up into the present times. And those who hold this view claim that they can see within the book of Revelation the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, the rise of the Catholic Church, the rise of Islam, the French Revolution, on and on and on. There are several different weird viewpoints in that historical camp, all which are conflicting with each other. There's a third viewpoint, the allegorical viewpoint. This sees the book of Revelation as 
uh, not historical, not literal, it's allegorical. That is, it's simply a picture of the timeless, constant struggle between good and evil. That also ignores that it's uh, a prophecy and the uh, graphic prediction that it is a prophetic book. It ignores that. And the fourth and final viewpoint is the viewpoint that I hold that is the futurist viewpoint. The futurist viewpoint. Now we tip our hat to the historical and we say that part of the book has been fulfilled like the seven letters to the seven churches. But beginning in chapter 6 through chapter 22, all of that is yet future. That has not been fulfilled. It will be fulfilled in the future. And the future events that it speaks about are the second com coming of Christ, the millennial kingdom of Christ, the great white throne judgment, and the eternal state. All of those are yet future. That fourth viewpoint, the futurist viewpoint, seems to line up best with scriptures like Matthew chapter 24, the words of Jesus about the last days. And it is the only viewpoint that maintains the consistency of interpretation, which is the grammatical, historical interpretation of the Bible. So, we're in chapter 12. And we've been following through, and when we left off, we were right in the middle of the tribulation. Chapter 6 through chapter 19 deals with the tribulation period. And there were seven seals and seven trumpets, and seven bowls, and each set of judgments ushers in the next set of judgments, so that the seventh seal, when opened, brings forth the next set of judgments, the seven trumpets. And when the seventh trumpet is blown, that ushers forth the last and final set, which is the bowl judgment. With each series of judgments, they become progressively more intense until we're right in the heart of what Jesus called the Great Tribulation. Now when these judgments are over, and they will happen quickly, when it's over, judgment is over, and Jesus Christ will return. So chapter 11, verse 15, introduces us to the seventh trumpet that is blown. And the seventh trumpet will usher in the last seven judgments, as I mentioned, the bold judgments which aren't even listed until chapter 16. So what we noted last week is that you have chronology followed by parenthesis. You remember that? You'll have a chronological flow of the tribulation period and then a parenthesis or you're catching up to add more information to the story and then you continue with the chronology and then you add a parenthesis and in chapters 12, through 14 is a huge parenthetical statement. We are introduced in chapter 12 to a rare behind the scenes look at the great cosmic struggle between light and darkness, good and evil, Satan or the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God. In verse 1, now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. And then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Now who is the woman? Well, it depends on who you ask. Because a lot of people have identified her with a number of different people or events or things or analogies, allegories. But I can tell you with a great deal of certainty that this woman is the nation of Israel. And it's because of the scripture that gives us that hint. You know, we mentioned last week that the book of Revelation is filled with biblical symbolism. So find in the Bible where you have 12 stars and the sun and the moon and you'll get your answer. And that takes us back to Genesis 37 when a young man named Joseph had a couple dreams. Remember that? And the second dream he had, he told his parents and his brothers and he said, Hey, I had a dream that the sun... And the moon and the 11 stars, he is the 12th, the other 11 stars all bowed down to me. And his dad gave him the interpretation. His dad rebuked him saying, shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down and worship before you? So Joseph's father, Jacob, understood that the dream of 
sun, moon, 12 stars, is Jacob, Rachel, and the 12 boys, the 11 bowing down to the 12. This is the nation of Israel. And it doesn't surprise us, does it, to see the nation of Israel prominently displayed in last time's prophecy. We would expect it. And why would we expect it? Because we're told in places like Jeremiah chapter 30 that the tribulation period goes by another name. The time of Jacob's trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble. And even Daniel chapter 9, doing the 70 weeks of Daniel, what did the angel say? He predicted the future time period that is for your people. That is the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. So here we see the nation of Israel pictured as emblematically a woman pregnant and in pain giving birth to a child. The child is none other than Jesus Christ. And we don't have to read very far and we understand that. Verse 3, another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems or crowns on his heads. By the way, Satan is called a dragon 13 times in the book of Revelation. And you don't have to guess who the dragon is. You go down to verse 9 of this chapter and it tells you that it is Satan, that it is the devil. Notice his strength. Notice his authority. He has seven heads. That speaks of completeness. He has ten horns. A horn is always a biblical symbol of strength. And he has crowns on his head. In other words, this guy is dominating the world. Dominating the world. And we'll see that in chapter 13 through the Antichrist. Verse 4, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and drew them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. In one verse, we go from incarnation to coronation. What a sweep that is in verse 5. He came, he is eventually going to rule all the nations, he is caught up to God and to his throne. Satan, the dragon, hates Israel, the woman. Why is that? Well, it's pretty obvious why. If he could not only hate, but if he could destroy the woman, then he can prove that God cannot keep his promises to na the nation of Israel, and more than that, destroy any hope of this promised Messiah or deliverer that the Old Testament spoke about. So, if God's plan of redemption required the existence of a nation, if you could destroy that nation, you will have thwarted God's plan. And that sums up in a nutshell the cosmic conflict throughout the Bible, the behind-the-scenes conflict that goes on in the Scripture. There's a promise back in Genesis, early on, chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. I'll read it to you. From now on, you and the woman, God says to Satan, the serpent, you and the woman will be enemies. And your offspring, and your offspring will be enemies. He, that is your offspring, the male child, he will crush your head and you will bruise or strike his heel. So early on, Satan was promised that there's coming someone who's going to crush his head, crush his authority, take away the fangs of authority that he has in this world. Now, if I promised you that after the service tonight, I'm going to meet you in the parking lot and I'm going to crush your head, which I never would do that. But if you were reasonably sure that I, I meant it, you would do everything you could to avoid that possibility. Maybe even a counterattack. And so we see... Satan attacking the woman, Israel, through history to get at the male child who will eventually crush his head. As the intelligence goes out throughout history, the attack and counterattack from Satan comes. I'll give you a few examples. 
I believe it was Satan that motivated Cain to kill his brother Abel. Because Abel would be the promised seed that would bring the righteous deliverer. But he was killed. God raised up another seed through Seth. I believe it was Satan who corrupted the earth so badly that God had to eventually destroy everything on earth and everyone through a worldwide flood, except one family. And through that family, he started bringing his promise to fruition through history. Later on, I believe it was Satan that prompted Esau to attempt to kill Jacob because Jacob was also the one who was promised in the lineage. Later on, it was Satan that prompted Pharaoh to give out this weird decree that if a Jewish baby is born that is a male child, you shall kill it. Why on earth would that decree come out? It was satanically inspired to get at the seed that would crush the head of Satan because he's just learning sort of like the satanic CIA, the intel that's coming from heaven, i.e. the prophecies through the ages, and he is working to counteract that. We follow through the Old Testament, and we see that Saul would attempt to kill David because he's the messianic line. We see in the book of Esther that Haman tries to kill all the Jews in the empire in an attempt to destroy the seed. So his plan was to kill the woman, Israel, before the male child was born. That didn't work. So now, once the child is born, as Revelation says, he wants to kill the male child. That's why, that's why Herod the Great issued a decree that all of the male children, all of the babies in Bethlehem, be killed from a certain age and younger. It was satanically inspired to destroy the seed that would crush the head of Satan. Verse 6 of Revelation 12, Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she is a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there for 1,260 days, three and a half years, the last three and a half years, the great tribulation period. Verse 13, now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to a place where she is nourished for a time, times, and a half a time. A biblical way of saying three and a half years from the presence of the serpent. Satan is in the future going to unleash his fury against the nation of Israel during the tribulation period. It's going to be one of the worst times of persecution for that people group ever. That will require the Israelis to flee and to hide. And the signal for them will be the abomination of desolation, the midpoint of the tribulation when the Antichrist sets himself up as God. Jesus predicted that. Remember what he said, Matthew 24? When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And it is believed that the mountains Jesus spoke about and the area that John in Revelation spoke about is a place called Petra, which some of you have been to. We visited there together. A hidden place the ancient capital of the Nabataean kingdom, southeast of the Dead Sea, over in Jordan today, a place that is greatly protected by mountains and ravines, a very difficult place for any army to march through. Either way, God is going to protect them during this time after the abomination of desolation. Now God says two wings of a great eagle were given to this woman. I did a little digging and discovered that that's a beautiful symbol, emblem of God's protection. You, you may remember back in Exodus chapter 19, I believe, God said to the people of Israel, remember how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself, speaking of the deliverance out of Egypt. So it's a beautiful symbol of God's protection. Now some people believe, I've read this, I can't be dogmatic, I can't be sure one way or the other, but some people see that the wings of an eagle are the United States. And, and perhaps it's because some of us are worried that the United States is not plainly mentioned in prophecy, and it worries us. Like, well, what's going to happen to us? 
But some have thought this could be maybe the Air Force and the 6th Naval Fleet that's partly at least stationed in the Mediterranean that's going to help bring them to that area and protect them. It's interesting guess. It's what some believe. So Israel will be protected as they flee from the presence of the serpent. Verse 1, chapter 13. Then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast. Now chapter 13 introduces us to the one of the most important personalities in that period of time, Daniel's 70th week, or Jacob's trouble, or the tribulation period, that is the Antichrist. That's what we typically know him as. He actually goes by 50 different names in the Bible, and probably the last one is the Antichrist. Paul calls him the man of sin, also calls him the son of perdition, also calls him the lawless one. It's John who calls him the Antichrist in 1 John. Verse 1, I stood in the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, again, world dominion authority, and on his heads a bla 